want to change gears to talk about something uh, that I've I've alluded to a couple of times in the past, which is a phenomenon that we see in patients taking this new class of drug. I mean, it's not really a new class of drug. It's been around for a decade, but a class of drug that has gained a lot of popularity in the past uh, probably two to three years, which is the GLP-1 agonists and mm-hmm. the, um, the, dual, the dual agonists with GIP as well. And <clears throat> Again, we don't have an enormous and overwhelming body of evidence on this. You know, we don't have that many patients in our practice, and we frankly don't have that many that take it. But certainly over the past three years, uh, <clears throat> you know, I have to think we've seen two dozen patients on these drugs. And again, in all cases, we have overnight information on heart rate and heart rate variability. And so the unambiguous sign that we see is that resting heart rate is going up. Hmm. Um, And it's going up an average of 10 beats per minute with a range of about 8 to 12. Uh, And again, this is unmistakable. It's not subtle. And when they come off the drug, usually within a month, it goes back to normal uh, for patients who do indeed go off the drug. We're also yeah. seeing a compression of heart rate variability. So we see heart rate variability come down, although that's less predictive. But I now realize we're kind of using the standard. We're not using like a Morpheus. We're using kind of the aura ring or whatever. And, you know, maybe those data just if that aren't as fully. accurate. Yeah. Um, so my first question for you is, if there's something going on in a drug that is predictably driving heart rate up, would you expect it is also driving heart rate variability down? Do those tend to move in that generally opposite speaking, direction? Yeah, the, generally speaking, you'd see that. Now, just as you mentioned that, my thought would be it's a strong appetite suppressant. Correct. The vagus is very tied to appetite. So if you think about this, if we were to turn up that sympathetic dial our hunger gets turned down. We don't really want to be hungry while we're in the middle of some stressor, right? But after that period of stressor is over, theoretically we've earned energy, we need to restore and eat. And so the vagus is very connected to the gut and to hunger centers, and it feeds up into the medulla and it's controlled hypothalamus. There's a very strong vagal relationship to hunger and the desire to eat. So I almost wonder if suppressing the vagus and decreasing uh, HRV and increasing heart rate is a byproduct of how this is inhibiting appetite. Yeah, interesting. That would make sense. And and, and so it's an interesting question because it it, it then leads to another question, which is if I told you that I'm going to change you in a way that your heart rate is 10 beats higher and your HRV is 10 milliseconds lower, you would say, well, whatever you did was negative. Sure. Like, I mean, there's a cost to that, right? right? Do we think that that could be the case here? I mean, again, we're really wildly speculating, yeah. but but this is, you know, I get asked all the time, Peter, are these drugs safe? Are these drugs good? What do you think of them? And I am always say sort of the same thing, which is, look, clearly for some people, whatever unknown exists around these drugs is worth it, right? Like if you're, if an individual, you know, goes from being 250 pounds to 200 pounds and having a hemoglobin A1C of 7% to 5.5%, that is so positive for them that I think it justifies whatever unknown exists around these drugs. If there's no other way they're going to achieve that benefit. Um, But I'm really more interested in these marginal cases of people who don't have diabetes and want to lose 20 pounds which, by the way, might not really matter in their overall health. Yep. It's cosmetic. And are they taking too big a risk? That That's kind of the question I'm interested in. And that's why I keep coming back to, if it raises your heart rate that much and lowers your heart rate variability, is there, is it, is it doing so, is that, are we picking up a signal that is just a niche representation of appetite suppression via the vagus nerve, or is it actually playing a role in the parasympathetic sympathetic dials. I would imagine it's, it's got to be, I mean, t- to move it that large, 10 beats is a fairly significant amount. I would can't imagine that's not having an actual effect on our ability to regulate ourselves effectively. We're probably in a more sympathetic state all the time, which is going to have a cost. Now, if it's a few weeks or a month, you know, maybe that cost is relatively small. I don't know. Um, but if it's weeks or months and these, they're, they're living on this drug, yeah, there's, I would suspect there's a real cost to that. And to your point, if it's the benefit is they lose a bunch of weight and all their blood markers improve and we see health outcomes, maybe it's certainly worth yeah. that cost. But maybe somebody, like you said, who cosmetically wants to lose weight and they have an easier time on the drug at doing that, you know, is that a net benefit? 
I mean, it's hard to say because we don't have long-term studies on those drugs. Um, but I would just kind of say in general that, yeah, if we see these noticeable decreases in HRV and these very noticeable increases in heart rate, that's a real sign that the body is, is that autonomic nervous system is being adjusted in an artificial way. And that probably is not a good thing in the long run, specifically if it's for a long time. Yeah, I um, I don't know where the companies are at in terms of their uh, post surveillance, uh, meaning post marketing surveillance studies, and if this is a metric that they're tracking or interested in. But um, again, given the popularity of these drugs, like uh, there's no shortage of opportunities to to kind of measure these things. Yeah, it'd be interesting to see. Like, also, I'd be curious to see what happens when they come off. Do we see a big rebound? Does their heart rate stay suppressed? Is it you know? We, how, how does it again, change? our sample size is so small that I want to be very careful and sure. note that you know everything I'm saying is you know again it, it could be nothing. It could be that you know it's just a very small n, and you know 25 people is not enough. But the thing is, in the 25 people, I've never seen an exception. So sure. that's, you know, Consistent. when you don't need statistics to measure things, you kind of need to pay a little closer attention yeah, to I mean, them. It's, it's pretty hard to modulate uh, appetite that significantly without suppressing the vagus to some extent. Yeah. It's so closely connected. But we do see everything come back to normal when people are off the drug. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm trying to remember, it's been a while since I've looked. I feel like it's within a month, maybe even less. It might be within two weeks. Everything is coming back to normal. The half-life is very long on those, so it probably does take a few weeks to yeah. clear out. Um, and I don't think I have enough insight to contrast the two most popular drugs, semaglutide and terzepatide. Um, but again, I don't think these drugs are going anywhere and I would love to better understand this. Um, my guess is there are a number of people on these drugs that might not be aware of this because either they're just not tracking it or they are, but they haven't, they haven't noticed it. You know, I, I, some patients will say this after a few months and I realized they kind of forgot when I told them this in the first place. Um, but anyway, wondering if you had seen anything about that or heard anything about it, but yeah, I mean, you see it in like, I mean, ADHD medications, for example, got it. You yep. see a very suppressed HIV and a very elevated, uh, sympathetic heart rate and heart rate you see in several type of things like that. Any sort of strong stimulant, obviously those are not stimulants, but people who live on caffeine and Red Bull and are constantly, um, shoving coffee, like to constantly turn that sympathetic dial up is to me a kind of sign that the sympathetic system isn't working the way that it should by itself, probably because you've overstimulated to begin with through stress and the lack of ability to turn that off. And we see people reach for stimulants and artificial ways of turning that sympathetic dial up once their their body's not doing it the way that it should. And so, you know, we see people kind of self-medicate with stimulants to, to get that sympathetic response when if they had been able to manage stress more effectively, they probably would have a normally normal functioning sympathetic system that wouldn't need that artificial stimulus to, to turn it up. Mm -hmm.